Welcome to the video lesson on the control of microbial growth. Um, now that you are well versed in the details of microbial metabolism after the last few video lessons and the work we've been doing in class and in the lab, um, it's time to turn our attention to uh, the control of microbial growth. Uh, the scientific control of microbial growth uh, really only began in the mid-1800s uh, during what is frequently referred to as the golden age of microbiology. Uh, the period between 1857 and 1914 saw an explosion of discoveries in the field of microbiology, uh, spearheaded by people you've probably heard of, uh, Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch. Um, it wasn't until the late 1860s that the concept of the germ theory postulated by Koch was actually applied to medical procedures. Uh, doctors at that time rarely <laughs> washed their hands between patients uh, and were unknowingly the cause of most of the transmitted infections between patients. You may remember in the summer reading, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, there was a discussion about the uh, transfer of, uh, of microbes uh, by surgeons. Uh, an English doctor, Joseph Lister, actually began applying phenol solutions, which is a disinfectant, to surgical wounds and saw a significant reduction in infections and deaths. Um, that procedure was quickly adopted by other surgeons and was one of the uh, earliest medical attempts to control infections by microorganisms. You may uh, recognize the name since Listerine is named after Joseph Lister. Um, there are several terms that are frequently used and, to be honest, misused in discussing the control of microbial growth. Uh, the table on this slide summarizes the most commonly used terms. Uh, these terms, uh, the terms on the table are presented really in the order from the most lethal to uh, the least lethal um, and are ones that you will see on labels uh, and will hear used and misused so it'd be nice to be the educated one and be able to correct people. Uh, the first one there is uh, sterilization. Sterilization really is the technique um, that we use uh, in the lab to prepare all the media that we have been using. Um, we also sterilize any, everything after an experiment to make sure that we kill all the microorganisms uh, from the experiment before we dispose of uh, any of the petri dishes or we reuse any of the tubes. Um, it's it's uh, usually done with uh, in the autoclave and we'll talk about that uh, in the next slide. Uh, disinfection and antisepsis are probably terms you have heard used before um, and are really the same thing except by uh, the only difference being the nature of the surface that's being cleaned or treated. Uh, antiseptics are used to treat living tissue such as the skin whereas disinfectants are used um, on inert sub uh, surfaces like counters or uh, instruments in the in the kitchen or in the lab or something like that. Uh, the same chemical could actually be used both as a disinfectant and an antiseptic and it's safe if it's safe to use on living tissue. Uh, you're certainly familiar with many of the different products that are used as disinfectants. Lysol, bleach, alcohol, hydrogen peroxide are just a few of the common ones. Um, Listerine is a common um, antiseptic mouthwash. Again, used to destroy uh, pathogens that are on living tissue. Uh, the other term that you will run across is sanitation, uh, which is really, it's not to eliminate, the goal is not to eliminate all the microbes, uh, but simply to lower the microbial counts to what would be determined uh, safe public health levels. Uh, hand sanitizers, for example, we've talked about this a little bit in class, don't eliminate all of the bugs, they just lower the numbers to safe levels. Water, drinking water gets sanitized, um, and that does not kill every bug that's in there, it simply gets it down to levels that are deemed safe. Uh, in this next slide the, uh, just shows you a quick uh, diagram of the autoclave. We have a couple of them in the back prep room. If you haven't seen them, you want to stop in and show you. It's what we use to sterilize all the media we use. Basically, it's a, it's a high-tech pressure cooker. Uh, door seals up and we, by having uh, the water in there heated up, by having the uh, door sealed, we can get the pressure much higher, which as you remember from chem, will allow the uh, temperature to get even higher. So the when we run the autoclave, we run it at uh, 15 uh, psi or pounds per square inch above the normal atmospheric pressure, which actually allows us to get the temperature in there to be about 121 degrees centigrade, which is pretty darn hot and will kill most all of the bugs that we um, would encounter in the media. Uh, modern medicine was really transformed in the early part of the 20th century with the discovery of antibiotics. Uh, most of you will probably be familiar with the discovery of that first antibiotic, uh, penicillin, was actually quite a serendipitous discovery by Alexander Fleming. 
when he noticed uh, that the growth of the microbes he was studying was actually inhibited by a colony of mold that had contaminated uh, one of his petri dishes. Uh, the mold, uh, Penicillium notatum, was uh, producing a compound that was later uh, named penicillin that actually inhibited the growth of the bacteria on the plate. Uh, in the 1940s and 50s, uh, several other antibiotics were discovered, isolated for medical use. Uh, in this slide you see a picture of the actual plate uh, by, taken by Fleming of his contamination there with the penicillium colony up there. Notice how the, the bacteria are not growing up close to that colony. Um, there's also a list of some of the uh, common uh, antibiotics that have been discovered. You notice uh, some names you're probably familiar with on there, erythromycin, bacitracin. All of those are ones that actually are biological in nature. They come from other organisms. Uh, as you can imagine, they would be a, a useful weapon if you're trying to eliminate competition or prevent other bugs from growing up into your area if you are growing on a, on a surface. Um, when we talk about the spectrum of, anti um, uh, of activity of antibiotics, we're referring to uh, the specific types and ranges of cell types uh, that a particular antibiotic is effective against. There are many antibiotics that are effective against prokaryotic cells that have actually no effect on eukaryotic cells or of humans. Uh, this specificity stems from some fundamental differences between the two cell types. Uh, most notably, in a bacteria, you have cell walls that are not present in eukaryotic cells. So many of the antibiotics will target the cell wall. Again, we'll get into some of the details of this a little later. Um, the difference between the ribosomes. Eukaryotic ribosomes and prokaryotic ribosomes are uh, structurally uh, very, very similar, but different enough that some of the antibiotics target the prokaryotic uh, ribosome, but do not uh, target the eukaryotic ones, so obviously they would have no impact on eukaryotic cells. Also there are some details of the metabolism of prokaryotic cells that is unique that allows some of the antibiotics to target very specific pathways of metabolism um, that are found only in prokaryotic cells and not in eukaryotic ones. Antibiotics are frequently the categorized as being either broad spectrum or narrow spectrum, depending on the range of the different microbial types they affect. Broad spectrum may impact all gram-positive cells, whereas the narrow spectrum antibiotic may work only against a couple particular genera or species. So we hear the term broad spectrum versus narrow spectrum, it's talking about how many different uh, types of bacteria would be affected by it. Another term, or two other terms you will hear referred to uh, in reference to antibiotics is our bacteriostatic versus a bacteriocidal antibiotic. Static means stationary or still. Uh, in this context, a bacteriostatic antibiotic does not necessarily kill the living cells. What it will do is prevent them from dividing and growing, the culture from dividing and growing, so it will maintain static, how many cells there are, as opposed to a bacteriocidal antibiotic, which not only prevents them from growing, but actually kill the cells that are there. Um, so you will see, hear those two terms, and we'll talk about how uh, you could predict what type of antibiotic, whether it's bacterial, bacterial, bacterial static or bacteriocidal, you had based on its uh, modes of action which leads us to this next slide, talking about the different modes of action. Uh, most of the modes of action target specific metabolic processes. A uh, quick review, remember we have uh, one process that would be important uh, that might be able to target is replication, going from DNA to DNA. When a cell is dividing, it needs to make copies of its DNA. Uh, transcription is a process that gets targeted frequently uh, when you're going from DNA to messenger RNA during that process ultimately to make proteins. Uh, there's also the process of translation and going from messenger RNA to protein, which involves the ribosomes. Uh, those are, are there's prime targets there. Uh, metabolism in general. We talked about certain pathways, which will be specific to uh, eukaryotic. Excuse me, to prokaryotic cells, but not found in eukaryotic cells that can be targeted um, by certain antibiotics. Uh, if we look at nucleic acid replication and transcription, there are a couple uh, antibiotics in particular that you'll hear used in this context. Uh, the quinlinones and rifampin um, are two that are, are very effective because they interfere with DNA replication and or transcription. The problem with these is that uh, they the processes of replication and transcription are so very, very similar in prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells that frequently a lot of toxic side effects of their use uh, 
So they are not ones that are uh, always used as the first line of defense in treating a, an infection, since there will be frequently side effects that you want to try to avoid if you are a physician. Uh, the next uh, area we talk about protein synthesis. Examples of antibiotics that target protein synthesis, in particular, chloramphenicol, erythromycin, tetracyclines, and streptomycin. They tend, they will uh, go after usually the ribosomes. Again, we'll look at this in a little more detail in a, in a slide coming up. But those are some examples of, of antibiotics that target the translation pro process. Uh, you can also talk about targeting cell wall synthesis, since bacteria have a cell wall and eukaryotic cells do not. Um, there are a number of drugs, the penicillins, most notable, and some, and some of the others, bacitracin, vancomycin, which interfere with that process of cell wall synthesis, so they can be very effective at knocking out bugs. Uh, the cell wall synthesis antibiotics. Uh, plasma membrane injury. There are some antibiotics, uh, most notably polymycin B, which literally poke holes in the cell membrane, which allow it to become very leaky and porous and, and prevent the cell from being able to regulate movement in and out, and ultimately will, can kill the cell. Uh, obviously, those are ones that would have to be targeting very specific, um, unique plasma membrane properties of prokaryotic cells in order to not have the same kind of toxic side effects um, that we saw with the nucleic acid replication targeting uh, antibiotics. There are a few uh, examples of antibiotics, the sulfon uh, sulfonilamides, uh, which will target very specific pathways in the prokaryotic cells metabolism that aren't found in eukaryotic cells. Again, some of those are tend to be uh, narrow spectrum antibiotics since they will go after uh, idiosyncratic metabolic steps that certain uh, strains of bacteria will have that others won't. Uh, as we move over to the next slide, here's a couple uh, examples uh, showing you some of the structures of some of the common antibiotics. Again, you notice they're very complicated, uh, large mo molecules, organic molecules. There's also a couple things about these I want to note. Uh, one thing in particular in the penicillin type drugs, you have uh, something called the beta lactam ring, this five membered ring that you see right in here, which is a common structure to all those psyllin type drugs. Uh, that will be important uh, when we talk about how uh, certain bacteria can become resistant to antibiotics. They will target that beta lactam ring. Um, Again, these are some of the, the ones that you may have uh, heard of or had prescribed to you, so I wanted to show you a couple of those. Uh, we zero in on that, that inhibition of cell wall synthesis that we talked about, the penicillins. Uh, you may remember from back when we did uh, structure of cells that the uh, peptidoglycan, which makes up the cell wall, has those uh, alternating NAMs and NAG molecules, but are also held together by cross bridges. It's those cross bridges shown here with these arrows, which are the target of the penicillin drugs. The penicillin drugs uh, prevent that cross bridge from being formed. There's an enzyme that's involved in forming that cross bridge, and penicillin interferes with that process. So if you don't form the cross bridges, the peptidoglycan loses the integrity, and as a result, the cell becomes very porous and is, is unable to resist the osmotic pressure um, that exists because of the concentration of solutes inside and outside the cell, and essentially the cells will rupture. Clearly, that would only be impacting cells that are trying to actively grow. Once a cell has, has its peptidoglycan uh, made, uh, the penicillin will really have no effect on it, so that would be an example of a bacteriostatic type drug. Only would interfere with cells when they're trying to replicate and make new cell walls.